I'm Sharon Brett Kelly and today on The Detail I'm in Waikato at Ruakura and I'm standing here with the Chief Executive of Tainui Group Holdings, Chris Joblin. This is, <laughs> we're in the middle of nowhere in a way, aren't we? But we're smack bang in the middle of the Golden Triangle. But it feels like the middle of nowhere because right in front of us is a huge security gate and then we've got um, another big fence here. And over to our left is a huge digger. Give me some statistics about this project, Chris. So this will be the, the largest industrial development in New Zealand and probably in Australasia at the moment. Size-wise, 490 hectares. We've currently got about 300 people working on site. We've moved you know, the better part of a million cubic metres of, of earth um, to create the wetland and, and basically to contour the site. It's about five and a half kilometres long and about three and a half kilometres wide at its widest point. We're about three and a half kilometres to the CBD of Hamilton and we're adjacent to the Waikato University. Ruakura Super Hub is the largest project undertaken by Tainui Group Holdings, the tribe's commercial arm. When finished, there'll be an inland port, a warehouse zone for importers and exporters, a service centre with a green hydrogen station and a wetland. And everything here is supersized, from the machines moving the dirt to the 40,000 square metre warehouses. I'm here to find out how this ambitious logistics project is going to unlock the Golden Triangle of Tauranga, Hamilton and Auckland, but also why it is so significant for the iwi. So, back at the site of the wetland with Chris Joblin. What we've built here is a 10 hectare wetland which will take you know, all the water you know, from the site and, and basically bring it through a series of, of effectively streams and, and lakes. This is going to be open to the public through a series of boardwalks. And so what we're doing is, is bringing to life uh, a logistics and industrial ecosystem, but how we do that also has a foundation in improving... Yeah, the environment at the same time. Wait for this big one to go past. So you'll see here we've got a 100 tonne dump truck that's just coming past us now with the carrying a bit of sand. So all women driving these machines? Yeah. A lot of the people that are driving, you know, these huge trucks, you know, they are a woman. So one of the things that we're really proud of too here is the opportunities for training people. And we've just had a grader uh, drive past us and the, the young lady that we're driving that would have been trained on, on the site. And driving the grader is, is probably one of the most skilled jobs within the, the, the earth moving part of what we're doing here. Would she be Tainui or not necessarily? Uh, a lot of the people here that are getting these opportunities are Waikato Tainui mm -hmm. uh, tribal members, um, but there are also people from the wider community as well. 16 years ago, what would this have looked like? So 16 years ago, this was basically a dairy farm milking circa 600 cows. But And owned by Tainui? Yeah, it was owned by the tribe, so this piece of whenua came back to the tribe in the 1995 Raupatu settlement with the, with the Crown and so what we're doing now is, is bringing this to the highest and economic you know, best use. I'm taking a tour of Ruakura Super Hub with Chris and Tainui Group Holdings Supply Chain Strategy Director Dave Christie. <laughs> Where are we? Uh, so we're on the, the old Ruakura route um, and you can see directly in front of us is the East Coast Main Trunk which is the main railway link between Tauranga and Auckland and then over our right shoulder is the new Waikato Expressway which is a brand new State Highway 1 which, and so the East Coast Main Trunk and the Waikato Expressway border the, the Ruakura development. If you didn't know what this place was it just looks like a rural thing with a an old house over there, an old house behind us, and a bit of roadworks. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. and I think that's the the uh, the challenge for us, I guess, at Tainui, is that there's there's we believe this is a 
going to be unlocking the Golden Triangle. But at the moment, you know, when you look at it, as you say, you see kind of farmland, maybe a few sheds being built. But in fact, when you look at this in 20 years in the future, it'll be the epicentre of logistics in the North Island. Where are we going to? Oh, the, the so, inland port. Well, so we, yeah, we're going to drive through into the logistics precinct, which will then take us into the Ruakuta inland port. So we're just driving along, a, it looks like a very new road here. Yes, exactly few trucks coming and going but it's pretty quiet yes yeah, so it's uh we've only got one tenant operational at the moment the first inaugural tenant for Ruakuta, which is uh, peter baker transport express all the other trucks you can see here are construction vehicles um so massive warehouses yes it's all about the connectivity between what currently in new zealand are disparate supply chains that's so the import supply chain where you bring in goods off from offshore you know, all, almost always in containers, mm-hmm. and they, those containers then have to flow to the distribution centres where they get devanned, and normally all that activity happens in Auckland. So what we're doing is saying, no, well, given the flows that go through the Golden Triangle, we'll bring that volume into Ruakura here, we'll devan it in Ruakura in those big warehouses you're seeing, and, uh, and then when those containers are empty, instead of them flowing all the way back to the ports, we'll turn them around, take them to an exporter who's right next door, We'll load them up and then they'll head off to the port full. So it's a much more efficient, productive, less mm. wasteful supply chain. So here we are driving on to the inland port. The inland port. So what is going on here? There's a whole lot of trucks creating a road. So we're creating a hard stand which will allow us to hold the containers that will flow into and out of Ruakuta Superhub. We're developing a two rail sidings which allow us to bring trains off the east coast main trunk and bring the trains in here, park them, and we can take containers off them or put containers onto them. If they're an import container, they'll be taken to the warehouses, which we'll go and see shortly in the logistics precinct, then they'll get unloaded or devanned. And then the containers will get reloaded with export product, come back here, we'll put it on the train, and then they'll head off to the ocean ports. And how far away is it? The construction here will be completed this side of Christmas and will be open in early in the new year. When it opens, how many containers will be Sure, good, great, great and question, going? yeah, exactly. Um, when it's first opened, we, we project our capacity will be about 60,000 TU, which is TU, is another acronym we use in logistics, a 20 foot equivalent unit. Like a shipping container? Yeah, like a So it's a 20 foot shipping container, and then you have an FEU, which is a 40 foot shipping container. But once we develop the full 30 hectares, we think we can get to about a million TUs. Now, to give you some comparison, when Auckland was at its peak, it was just under a million before the COVID and all the challenges Auckland Port had. And Port of Tauranga is 1.3 million. But this will be a main linkage point to those two key ports. So where are those TUs going at the moment? Most import TUs end up in Auckland, and then they go to those distribution centres in Auckland. And that then leads to what we the third supply chain, which is a domestic supply chain, and those those all that cargo and freight and goods flow out of Auckland all the way through New Zealand, typically run north to south. And so they some go on rail, but most go on trucks. Uh, and so there's there's our first issue is that you've got a lot of cargo in, in New Zealand travelling on road rather than rail. Uh, and then the second issue is because the freight flow is typically one directional. Many of those trucks, and it's estimated about 40% of those trucks or trains, return back to Auckland empty. So you're moving fresh air. Is, is this going to help solve the supply chain crisis that we hear about over and over and over again? That's a big question. <laughs> so, so the simple answer is it will help. It'll be it'll form part of the solution to solve it. Yeah, we've all know of COVID. We all know of that, which has created the shipping challenges and the in shortages. Then you've got all these other issues going on, like um, Shanghai's closing down with, with COVID. You've got the Ukraine conflict or war going on. All of these things impact the global supply chain. New Zealand is, is so reliant on that shipping network in particular is that we get impacted by that. It's estimated that over COVID, New Zealand lost 20 to 30% of our shipping capacity along our coastline. That was because of all the delays those ships are experiencing getting into and getting out of their ports and their, and their circulation, uh-huh. now, whether it be up into Singapore, up into China, across into America. And so because of all those delays, they weren't getting through the circuit. Normally it's a weekly cycle, or they were often reducing to a fortnightly cycle. But if there are a whole heap of ships sitting off the coast of China, yes. how is this inland port address that? 
And that goes to some of the characteristics about New Zealand. Well, I think we do so over a million containers a year in New Zealand as our, as our export volumes. Singapore Port does 34 million containers a year. The, the projected global volume is something like 600 million containers a year. So our volumes are so, so small, right? So what that means is the vessels that come to New Zealand are quite small by global standards. And for them to come into New Zealand, they unload in the main in Auckland, but they then have to bounce around the coast to fill up. So that's not efficient. And so the bigger vessels that are starting to come to New Zealand now, the 12,000 TEU vessels, they are the ones that you want to make sure their time in New Zealand is really efficient, really effective. They don't waste any time on our coast. This inland port allows for the high volume, efficient flow to and from our seaports, which allows for the quicker progression of cargo onto and off ships on our seaports. Shall we move on to Go down to the Kuma. next thing? I'm looking at a massive warehouse under construction. It's for Kmart, the big Australian retail chain. And this warehouse and the site next door, where a warehouse is being built for Maersk, the shipping giant, this really epitomises what this Ruakura super hub is all about. Because what will happen is that a truck loaded with a container will drive just 500 metres up the road from the inland port, it will drop those imported goods off at the Kmart's warehouse and then that truck with the empty container will come right next door, just 50 metres, to the Maersk warehouse and pick up the exports, drive back down the road to the inland port and load that container onto a train to either go to Tauranga or Auckland ports. Why Kmart? It's the second big company on site. Firstly, Ruakura connects for their business. You know, it creates efficiency in their supply chain, gives scale and, and cost advantages. What we've been able to illustrate you know, to Kmart is the value of Ruakura, which they've got, you know, and they see how important this is going to be for their business over the long term. Mm. And sort of an interesting sort of anecdote, we had John Galtieri, the CEO of Kmart, just to, to we were standing in, in July, and um, he was giving a speech for, for the opening here of, of Kmart, and as he was speaking, one of the first sets of roof trusses got put onto the onto the structure here, and he and he sat down and he couldn't believe just what happened and in the space of talking for ten minutes how how much the building had grown in that short period of time. Yeah, right. John made a really interesting comment when we went through the formal opening of of the site, uh, and he said he's been to many. Uh, site openings through Australia, you know, because they've got many uh, branches and all through Australia. He said he'd never been to one like this one here at Ruakura, and that was partially because of the uh, the cultural presence that, and, and the way. And, and Chris talked about the connectivity between the values, and he said it was just the araha that he felt. And didn't obviously didn't use that word, but the you know, the relationship and the connection he felt here was amazing. And he just said he's never experienced in any what, other. Really? Site. Yeah, exactly. In, in yeah. what way? I mean, you know, here we are standing on an industrial very industrial site. How, how can he feel that kind of connection? In the formal opening, we did a karakia, we had an official Māori welcome uh, for, for him and his whole team. And so obviously Australians, this is something they're just not familiar with whatsoever. Uh, mm. And then that we, all, we all know that Australia's trying to make some strides in that area for the Indigenous people. And, uh, and I think it probably gave him some really good insights as to you know, how countries that are doing it well communities that are doing it well could actually connect with the indigenous uh, people of that land. This project you're saying is on a global scale? Yeah this is massive, I don't think, and to that point we made earlier, I don't think New Zealanders or even people in Hamilton quite realise just how massive the scale is. So you know uh, Chris has talked earlier about 490 hectares, the biggest operating inland port logistics centre in Australia at the moment is 260 hectares, so we're almost twice that. 
they're building one which is going to be roughly the same size as this, but actually we will be kind of Australian-esque in size, as it were, you know. So th- this is massive, mm. and this is why we say ultimately it's going to change the way freight flows around the North Island. Mm. Mm. One of the other responses to the global supply chain uh, issues is that we're seeing a lot more onshoring, particularly retailers and, and distributors, to carry a lot more stock onshore, and, and what that is driving is much bigger warehouses. So what Rurukura does is it creates the space to accommodate those much larger warehouses. Prior to COVID, you know, an efficient supply chain was measured by how little stock you carried. Now it's about how you make sure that you can service your, your retail footprint. I suppose people, when they hear about this, might think, oh my God, that's just more traffic on our roads. So if you drive past a truck on a road carrying a container, chances are it's probably empty. Yeah, it's being repositioned throughout the country. And if we can bring the importers and the exporters into one location, that is going to greatly reduce the, the number of trucks on the road. So Ruakura, um, by our estimates, will, will reduce 65,000 trucks off the road a year. So there's, there's about a billion dollar productivity gain for New Zealand in doing that. A year. A year. Mm-hmm. And you think about what that does in terms of decarbonisation you know, of our, our transport network, what it does around you know, creating greater efficiency and utilising infrastructure like rail. The benefits of Rurukura you know, are going to be shared by many. How many of these companies are going to set up warehouses here? Yeah, the demand for people to come to Rurukura is huge. We originally thought that to develop out the full 490 hectares would take us 50 years. I think the reality is it's more like 15 now. Well, you've got people knocking on your door saying yep, we want to set up. Is the, that right? The demand is great. Why has it taken 16 years to get to this point? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great question. So if you think about a, a site the size of Ruakura being 490 hectares, to get through the, the regulatory process or RMA... Um, takes a long time and it's complicated so we've had to firstly get this this area of land designated inside the Hamilton city boundaries we've had to work with Waka Kotahi around getting the interchange yeah, in this site we've had to go through zoning um, so getting it zoned from farmland into industrial logistics, all these steps take time. What, what's the investment? Uh, look we're We've spent tens of millions of dollars just to get to the start line to get through the through the the regulatory process, but that investment is reflective of the size of the the area that we're working with as well. That's the investment of Tainui Group Holdings that you're talking about tens of millions, and of course your partner is Port of Tauranga. Yeah, to get through the regulatory process, yeah, you know, it's, it's tens of millions of dollars, and then from there, we've invested into the inland port. Yeah, you know, we've spent. Uh, about a, a bit over a hundred million dollars in on infrastructure and bringing in roads, three waters, you know the the wetland and the swale network. So when you think about scale, you know a scale development like this, there are a lot of upfront costs. Is the government part of this? Yeah, project. So of that initial hundred and eight million dollars of infrastructure to build roads and, and wetlands, etc., to service the site and connect up to the expressway, um, the New Zealand government via the PGF and the shovel ready schemes have invested into the site to the tune of about fifty eight million dollars. And what it and has enabled us to do is to quickly move from telling people about Ruakura to showing them. Let's find out what this means for Waikato Tainui's 85,000 iwi members. Rahui Papa is a former director of Tainui Group Holdings and is the tribal support person for Ruakura and other Tainui projects. It's hugely significant. Uh, we had, prior to the confiscations of, the, of 1863, we were traders. We were uh, business minds uh, that was enveloped in our own tikanga, uh, in our way of doing things for the sustenance of the people. Ruakura today is a symbol of getting back to that type of 
trade and enterprise uh, where uh, where the world's goods are coming through the doors of our ports and into Waikato Tainui for uh, dissemination uh, across the different uh, areas. Uh, and also, um, in, in time, it'll be a doorway for Waikato, for Ibi, and for the Waikato communities to be able to trade from our point of view to the world. Oh, what do you mean by that? Because I can see how this is a hub, especially for those multinationals with the with the, that inland port. But at the level of Waikato Tainui in particular, how how does that work as a trading hub? Yeah, so we we're looking at also utilising things like Ruakura as a portway to disseminate our. Uh, our farming goods, our primary industry uh, activities uh, to the world. In terms of trickling down to the many thousands of people of Waikato Tainui, how significant is that? It's going to be hugely significant. Uh, Firstly, in the form of employment and training, uh, and then, you know, logistics training and security and a whole number of uh, jobs uh, that Ruakura will create. I think the estimated number is around 11,000 jobs um, for uh, servicing uh, Ruakura. And then also there's the... uh, uh, the rental activity uh, that T- that Tanui Group Holdings will facilitate that uh, will cause the uh, the tribal grants really uh, to be able to support um, the aspirations of Fakatupuranga 2050 uh, or the uh, health and well being uh, of our people in a social sense, in a health sense, in a a financial literacy uh, sense so that our people uh, will be able to benefit from activities like Ruakura. It's a long-term investment, isn't it? You know, 16 years ago when it first began, what did you think? I mean, it took must have taken incredible vision. Incredible vision, uh, a whole number of discussions, both within uh, the tribe and the communities, with the council, with various ministers over many governments, uh, and a whole number of those conversations absolutely entrenched the idea that Ruakura was a good movement, uh, not only for Waikato people, but for the Waikato region and for uh, New Zealand as a whole. Do you feel that this is an example of the importance of big iwi investments like this for growth of the regions? It's an example and a symbol of not just the thinking within the box, actually thinking outside the box. This is an example of rangatiratanga and kawanatanga as prescribed in Te Tiriti o Waitangi because when rangatiratanga and kawanatanga come together, magic happens. When we work together for uh, common goals, uh, not only for the goals and aspirations of Waikato, uh, but for Iwi Māori and for all of New Zealand, then these types of magical moments uh, come through. That's it for today. I'm Sharon Brett Kelly. The detail is public interest journalism funded through NZ On Air and produced by Newsroom for RNZ. You can get us downloaded free to your mobile device every weekday from any podcast platform. Today's episode was engineered by Mark Chesterman and produced by Sarah Robson. Bonnie Harrison is our associate producer. And thanks to Chris Joblin, Dave Christie and Rahui Papa. Kakite anō.